Welcome everyone to the first action workshop session of the event. So we've got a whole host of action workshops that have an hour long session to get into a few more details and also focus, shop, focus on those what can we do elements, you know, how can we act here? Um, and we've split up uh, the different sessions into a variety of different groups to target the different groups that, that are attending um, the Sustainable Earth 2021. Um, and this particular workshop is targeted at large organizations. So this workshop is about uh, net zero carbon strategy in large organizations, challenges and solutions. And it's being delivered um, by a number of members of the Plymouth Net Zero Carbon Action Group, and also some solution providers that we've engaged with. And so it's going to start off with an introduction to the group and what we're about. Um, then we're going to go and give an example of two carbon strategies. So one within the University of Plymouth and one within Devon County Council. And then we've got two examples of some solution providers that we've recently engaged with as an action group. So, um, without further ado, I'm actually going to introduce uh, the Plymouth Net Zero Carbon Action Group. Um, and I'm actually, I'm doing this for Louise um, Sawyer and uh, um, Emmanuel Marshall because um, unfortunately, Emmanuel's a bit unwell. So hi, Emmanuel, if you're there in the background. Um, but um, Louise has, has unfortunately not been able to join us because of a few technical issues. Um, but if you could move the slide on, Katie, that'd be good. Great. So in terms of the Net Zero Carbon Action Group, um, we're a group of the larger emitters across Plymouth, um, and we share best practice and also are keen to drive the necessary actions and to support net zero within Plymouth by 2030. So we can't do this across the board, but we're keen to help as organizations do this. And we, we were set up um, about a year ago when actually Louise um, contacted a few of us and said, a similar organization has been set up in Hampshire. Louise came from, um, from Hampshire and joined the hospital. Um, and it now works for uh, Devon and Cornwall Police. And she was keen to, to, to join up with the university, the city council and others. And it's grown significantly since then. OK, if you could move on to the next slide, please, Katie. OK, I have a feeling it was going to be a bit more than that, but if <laughs> so. In terms of the Plymouth Net Zero Carbon Action Group, um, we, we meet on a two monthly basis. Um, we've now got um, significant numbers of um, members um, and we're about sharing best practice. So we tend to start um, with um, some background around our carbon action plans and support each other around what we're doing within that and, and how we can set that out. Um, and then towards the end of um, the um, agenda, we typically invite a couple of solution providers to help us share um, areas that, uh, of action across the network with other members of the network. So it's very much around sharing that best practice. It is also about um, the strategic opportunity of working together um, and delivering that combined effort to pro provide that combined effort across Plymouth for, the, for our organizations. And so that's a quick summary of and what the Plymouth Net Zero Carbon Action Group is about. And in many ways, the agenda today reflects a typical agenda of our um, events. So if I could ask, please, if I could ask Jack um, to come to the stage um, and introduce us to the University of Plymouth's carbon strategy. Thank you very much, Jack. 
Hi, everybody. Thanks very much, Paul. I um, hope everybody's doing really well and that they're finding today's sessions really informative. I'm sure there's some really great discussions going on. Um, I'm here today to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour of the Net Zero strategy for the University of Plymouth. As you can see, my name is Jack Roberts and I'm the Energy Manager for the University. Unfortunately, our Head of Sustainability could not be here today, so I will be filling in for them. We have recently republished our carbon management plan and we have decided to focus on six main goals. Um, so our first main goal is that we want to be net zero for scope one and two emissions by 2025. We also want to reduce our electrical grid consumption by 20% and 25% for gas by 2030. Another one of our goals is that we want to develop a net positive framework accounting for the positive environmental impact that our researchers have whilst conducting at the university. In conjunction with this, we want to raise awareness and building a carbon community within the staff and student network and to really encourage engagement um, to assist in achieving our targets. We also want to be part of wider projects across both the city and also nationally to really encourage a large scale carbon reduction where possible. And finally, we want to reduce our scope three emissions to net zero in line with local or national targets. I've taken these next two graphs from our carbon management plan. Um, and I firstly wanted to talk through how we, uh, why we've, we've split out scope one, two and three emissions. So we know that scope one and two emissions can be directly impacted by our actions at the university. Whereas scope three emissions is a much bigger challenge and really relies on the wider challenges, including infrastructure changes, behavioral change, and also policy. I think these two graphs really nicely represent a breakdown of our carbon emissions. You can clearly see that the graph on the left, that our scope three emissions is our largest problem. Um, and this includes things like purchasing of paper and equipment, and also just the daily university life. The graph on the right shows a breakdown of emissions by sources. Um, and again, you can also see that the largest source is, um, is procurement. And of course, we've got all our other usual bigger emitters, such as gas, electricity consumption, um, travel. So we've got employee commuting and student commuting, but also air travel. This next graph um, has also been taken from our carbon management plan, where we've projected both our historic and our future projected emissions for scope one, two, and three. And as you can see on, um, on the, the yellow line there, that we've only recently been tracking our scope three emissions, but we do really hope to be able to achieve, achieve our goals. And this is a, a few ways that we've set it out. So with, with the targets um, for scope one and two particularly, we helped you narrow this gap by participating in PPA agreements and rego opportunities. And these will be with our electricity and gas suppliers. There are also wider investigations into delivering offset. So we're anticipating a delivery gap of around 64 tonnes. And we are currently writing our offset policy um, and would ideally like to be able to deliver something that's tangible for students and staff and, uh, and also visitors to the university. As for scope three, this is obviously a lot harder for us to directly impact. However, we are hoping to improve this by working on infrastructure, um, assisting with policy change at both the local and national level. Um, and this does really require a large bit of collaboration with the government as well as also the, the net carbon group that Paul has mentioned. It's also really important to realize that this is only a snapshot in time. It does represent our current situation and we are continually developing plans to reduce emissions and focusing more and more on scope three for the future. Alongside our net zero goals, as I mentioned at the beginning, we also have a commitment to reduce our electricity consumption by 20% and our gas consumption by 25% by 2030. So this graph here represents both our historic performance to date and also predicted future performance against our targets. As you can see here, over the next few years, we are predicting an increase in our gas consumption. Um, and this will be as a result of our CHP on site. 
So we are um, suggesting a, a bigger increase in our the operation of our CHP to maximize the electrical generation um, and its output. But following this, we are working on feasibility studies for converting our gas-led district heating system to an electrically led low temperature ambient heating and cooling loop. So this means that over time we will be in um, have our gas consumption declining, whereas our electricity consumption will be increasing as our buildings are converted to being electrically heated. As the national grid is increasingly electrified, this will have a positive impact on our scope one and two emissions for the future. I just want to finally finish off with a very brief slide and a link to our sustainability pages. You can also find this by searching sustainability at Plymouth University, uh, where you'll be able to find a copy of the carbon management plan, along with a whole host of additional information, plans and policies that are really interesting reads. Um, and I've also included our email address here if you had any particular questions that you wanted for us. And I'd again also like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for their time um, and to the Sustainable Earth Institute and Paul for hosting this event. Thanks ever so much, Jack. And um, you've already answered one of the questions that's come up on the, on the uh, feed, which is, could you provide a link to the latest copy of the carbon plan? So you were obviously thinking way ahead a couple of days ago. <laughs> So thanks ever so much, Jack. Um, and so now please can I ask um, Doug to come um, on stage and uh, join us um, and, um, and introduce the Devon County Council Carbon Plan. Thanks, Paul. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Doug Elton from Devon County Council. I work in the environment group there. Um, Katie, I can't share my screen because there are two screens already being shared um, if not I will just talk to my slides no I will start I will start talking while that's if you if you try and share your screen does it come up with anything at all if you try and share it now no the the button is grayed out and it says two people are sharing okay um, I will start. I'll start talking. That's okay. Fine. We'll we'll try and work it out in at back, backstage. Yeah, that's okay. Um, yeah. So the net zero commitment of Devon County Council uh, is to be net zero by twenty thirty, um, and that's including our supply chain. So across all three scopes. Um, the alongside that we have a target to be um, to get thirty percent of our energy consumption from renewables by twenty thirty. And we've been developing a plan with the help of the University of Exeter to see how we could achieve that. What we do know is that it's going to require significant amounts of offsetting to get that net zero uh, by 2030. Um, our carbon footprinting has been going on since 2005. Um, and due to a, bit of, a few legacy issues, we don't have that simplicity um, that uh, Plymouth University just showed us of scope one, scope two, scope three. We've got something that we call our corporate carbon footprint, and that's all of scope one and scope two, plus a little bit of scope three, um, and the little bit of scope three transport. So that's in, that's that's put in, into the corporate footprint alongside the business travel, the vehicle fleet, corporate property, street lighting. And the reason that's there is because historically we had really good data on the contracts that we operate to get children to school. We know exactly how many miles they're doing. We know the specific vehicles they're doing it in. And, and we integrated that contract uh, from the outset. So in that corporate footprint, we, we're currently at about 42,000 tonnes. And there are some emissions from that one, some del deliberate emissions. We don't include staff commuting and we don't include school buildings. And um, that's due to the decision we made that we don't have much financial or operational control over those two aspects. Doesn't mean we're not doing things to help reduce the emissions from those two aspects, um, but they're not included in our reporting. So our plan for that corporate footprint, scope one, scope two, and school transport, um, is that we will reduce that by a further 20% by 2030. Uh, so overall, that will be a 70% reduction from our baseline year of 2012. And alongside that, from now, 
through to 2030, we're going to gradually increase the amount of carbon we're doing over the decade until by 2030, we're offsetting 100% of that carbon footprint. So we're going to start with 5% offset and we're going to increase it uh, by between 5 and 10% each year till we get to 2030. The reason we're doing that is to stimulate a local market for uh, carbon offsetting. In terms of what we're going to do to get that further 20% reduction uh, in absolute emissions from that corporate carbon footprint is uh, a deep retrofit of 10 buildings. There are 10 main buildings that we operate from. We're going to have 50% of our fleet converted to electric vehicles. It's, it's only 50% because we operate a lot of large vehicles um, and we don't believe the technology will be available by 2030 to enable us to switch to a low carbon alternative. So that's where the carbon offsetting comes in. Uh, the LED street lighting program will have been completed. And in Devon, uh, the rural street lighting uh, and, and, and a lot of residential street lighting actually in quieter areas already switches off overnight. By the time that program's finished, the carbon emissions from the street lighting will be 90% lower than they were in 2012. In order to achieve the 30% of our total energy consumption from renewables by 2030, we've got a minor project of installing 400 kilowatts of solar PV on assets. So assets rather than buildings, because the county council has a lot of land, uh, including 85 farms that we might be able to make use of for that. And um, so quite critically, we're wanting to purchase local renewable electricity from new schemes. So we're working at um, understanding how place power purchase agreements with community energy organizations in Devon where we would pay a premium for that renewable electricity over what we're currently paying through our corporate contract and that price premium just tips the balance for the community energy organizations to have a viable investable uh, solar farm for example from which we would buy buy power and we're doing that in partnership with a number of large electricity consumers in Devon and, and that, that's that's progressing quite nicely in terms of the supply chain emissions, um, I couldn't quite see the slides that, that Jack was showing in terms of how big the supply chain uh, issue is for them. But for us, it's, it's eight times bigger than that corporate footprint that I was just talking about. Um, we've been monitoring it for a long time, but we do low quality data. We get government conversion factors that tell us if we spend a pound on a particular type of service, we're probably emitting a certain amount of carbon. And uh, we just do the maths and we come up with a very large number. We've also got a further issue, which is that um, any contract under £10,000 doesn't receive expert assistance from our procurement team. It's individual managers. You're managing a service that the county council provides, undertaking the purchasing. And so there's a lot of uh, procurement activity that doesn't necessarily implement the corporate procurement principles. And obviously, so we're trying to embed carbon into that, but there's an awful lot of activity um, that, that isn't covered. Thousands of suppliers. But um, if I could have shared your screen, I'm just going to share my screen. I'm going to check the button again. No, it's still grayed out. Um, we've got a huge Pareto tail of those thousands of suppliers in terms of how much um, uh, how much uh, financial value they are. We've got about 30 suppliers that represent best part of 40 percent of the value of our spend. Um, we spend best part of a billion pounds a year. 30 of those suppliers represent 40 percent of that. Using spend as a proxy for carbon, we are going to focus on those big suppliers first. So in terms of our supply chain strategy, we've recruited a dedicated officer. They've been in post um, for literally about three weeks and they're putting together a detailed plan as to how we're going to get this supply chain to net zero by 2030. So we're going to focus on those 30 largest suppliers. Many of those are already registered on a financial exchange, which means that they have good knowledge of their carbon emissions. They're required to report them every year. Um, so we'll be obtaining actual data from them uh, so that we can start improving the data um, quality uh, of, of the supply chain of scope three. But then, of course, we've got all the SMEs and the sole traders, which um, they're, they're a bigger problem in terms of education than carbon, we don't think, because generally they're implementing very small um, services for us but we've, we've we're thinking what we'll do with those is we're going to start simple and we'll just ask them uh, for perhaps their vehicle fuel data in, in year one of a contract and then year two we'll say right now tell us 
about your uh, buildings consumption, right? Year three, now start telling us about what you're purchasing on our behalf. And that brings us to the depth of the challenge, because ideally we want to get right back to the cradle of our supply chain. And that really will be a challenge, particularly where the SMEs are involved, um, where uh, you know perhaps they actually don't know um, where some of their products are ultimately coming from. The remainder will need to be offset um, from 2030, just like the corporate carbon footprint. Um, we've already established some principles for that. Um, the principles are that we want the offsetting to be in the UK, uh, so we will not be uh, using sort of the clean development mechanism um, um, protocols. And ideally, we want them to be in Devon. Um, and that's because we realise that, um, well, we're spending taxpayers' money for a start on the offsetting, so we should be getting the benefit for the people of Devon there. Not that the climate cares where it is, but, you know, through the carbon offsetting, we can get habitat creation um, and potentially recreation opportunities, things like that, uh, here in Devon. But the offsetting opportunities we want to make use of must be verifiable. And at the moment, it's only really the Woodland Carbon Code and the Peatland Code um, that have um, uh, habitats that you can get verified carbon offsets for. So that officer I mentioned, uh, sorry, I haven't mentioned them yet. We're recruiting a carbon offsetting officer alongside the procurement officer. Um, and they are going to get involved in working with partners to establish carbon offsetting verification methods for new habitats in Devon. Our coast in Devon has huge opportunities for, for kelp and seagrass, things like that. Um, and we'll be testing approaches. One approach we've already tested is uh, simply buying carbon on the open market through the Woodland Carbon Code. Um, we wanted to buy uh, some Woodland Carbon units that would turn into carbon uh, before 2030. And we couldn't. The, uh, the, we went to the market um, with essentially an open checkbook and the earliest time period that we could buy carbon for um, was the late 2030s. So there is already a shortage of carbon in the market. And they, there are a number of companies that are going to want to be buying carbon is, I'm assuming, going to rocket. So great opportunity for somebody out there who's got land to start uh, planting trees. Um, and that's another approach that the county council is starting to pilot. We will be um, trying to get Woodland Carbon Code verified uh, woodlands on our own land, um, appreciating that the carbon won't actually be locked down for quite a few years. Um, and then just finally to say um, that the annual implementation cost of our plan is about a million pounds a year. We've got the first two years funded. Uh, I've been tasked with showing our accountants uh, that we can put our money where our mouth is and spend that money. Um, and then I'm assured that if we can do that, then um, the following year's funding will come. But the plan will need to be iterative. Uh, new technologies will come along. We're going to learn more about the offsetting. We might realise that actually becoming net zero by 2030 is not possible, um, purely on the basis of we can't lock down enough carbon uh, in the way that we want to do it to achieve that. So there we go, Paul, that's me. Thanks ever so much, Doug, and apologies for the slight technical challenges we've been having okay. in the workshop. Um, people did see the slides. Um, but they weren't necessarily synced all the time, but we did our best at trying to sync them as far as possible. So uh, thanks ever so much, Doug. Oh, and also um, tomorrow afternoon, we have a session on carbon offsetting as well, uh, where we can hear from Rob Passmore about what they're doing in North Devon um, and also Paul Lunt, um, one of our um, academics around carbon offsetting as well. So just to let you know, a bit of a, a plug for tomorrow. Okay, so um, if I could now ask Darren um, to come to the stage. Thanks very much, Darren. Um, and your screen is all shared and it's all working well. That's brilliant. Okay, over to you, Darren. Fantastic. Thank you, Paul. And thank you to the Net Zero group for allowing me to speak this afternoon. So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Darren Davis. I am the Sentinel Business Development Manager for NG Impact. Uh, Sentinel is our energy management software, and I'm going to take a slightly different tack this afternoon in that I'm going to really get down to the, the root cause of all of our carbon and uh, net zero, which is the actual energy that we're using. So I want, just want to, I want to highlight an example and just show you a little bit about how we at NG are using this software to reduce customers' uh, consumption, which obviously has a direct result on the reduction in carbon. 
So I'm going to move to our data viewing. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to look at a, a school. So this is a real school in the UK uh, with their data for 2021. Um, now, I think anybody looking at this can probably see what the issue is initially in that we have this period of data here where there appears to be very little control on the gas use. The gas seems to be doing what it wants, um, which is in marked comparison to the later part of the year where it looks like control has been locked down much more effectively. Now, you can see that from it, almost immediately from a, a visual representation of the data. Um, what we're able to do in Sentinel is actually overlay the occupancy hours of this particular school. Um, and, and one of the, the benefits of doing this is you can instantly start to see, so if I just highlight this area here, um, what we can see is where the, the green line is high. This means that the school is operational. Uh, and conversely, down here, it represents the weekends. So what we can see is we do have weekend consumption, uh, but it is relatively well controlled. Um, but then if we start to move back towards here, we can see that you know, apart from here, where we actually lost the data for a few days, so we can't claim any credit for energy reduction, uh, we seem to be almost permanently using the energy. Um, another view of, of how we can essentially look at that is by creating an energy model um, for this particular meter, um, which is something I have shown to some of this group in the past. Um, unfortunately, I have about five hours of conversation for a 15 minute slot. So just having to pick um, a few areas uh, to demonstrate the power of Sentinel. Um, what we're looking at here, once this spins around and loads, is our consumption that we saw a few moments ago on the time series view. Um, and what we've done is we've overlaid that with an energy model. Now, this energy model is based on weather corrected consumption for 2019. As I'm sure we can all appreciate, 2020 um, and 21 have been very strange years for uh, normal energy operation. Um, so kind of redundant to uh, use that period for a baseline. What we can see, um, it confirms what we've seen on the on the earlier graph. Here we seem to be using far more gas than we thought we would. Um, and here we seem to be using it broadly in line with what we'd expect. Uh, what we have at the bottom here is our uh, analysis of the difference between our actual and expected consumption. And these hashtag twos represent um, trigger points in Sentinel where alarms would be raised. So as we can see here, we're raising some alarms here where we're massively over consuming. Um, and obviously the direct result of overconsumption is increased carbon, which then means some of the areas that, that Doug um, and Jack have spoken about earlier in terms of reducing emissions, you're having to do more work there when ideally the more work that you can do at this level, at your actual usage level, is going to you know, reduce the need to you know, offset extra tons of carbon uh, when you get down to your reporting stage. Uh, as you can see here as well, Sentinel actually puts on to the graph where we've raised an alarm. So what we're seeing here is uh, an alarm. The consumption is far above the levels we'd expect for uh, 2019, despite COVID restrictions. So we know that the schools were open. Um, but as I say, we still have this increased gas use. Now, obviously, Sentinel can only do so much. Uh, it could tell you you know, that there's a problem and it can give you some data on where, where the problem might be. But really, this would now be handed over to somebody on site, um, the site BMS controller, for example, um, and, and elements that you would want to check is, are your controls operating properly? Are you turning things off at the weekends when there's no occupancy levels? Um, and is the strategy right? And as we can see here, the strategy absolutely isn't right. Uh, and that now has been corrected. Um, and what we can see on the overall QSIM analysis is up to about here. We were about 115,000 kilowatt hours above what we expected. Now, on a cost basis, that is fairly notable and in terms of carbon as well. Um, but what you can see since corrective action has gone in, uh, we have now reduced. And from this point, we have actually 
pretty much managed to reduce almost everything and, and get ourselves back to a net zero position for this year. Now, obviously, the problem is it's taken us nearly six months to do that. And that's six months we could have been focusing on actual energy savings for this particular school. Um, but what I'm trying to illustrate is that with access to the data and especially high resolution data, you can really start to build a good understanding of what your building or buildings are doing, what your asset is doing, um, what your plant is doing with the aim of trying to reduce your consumption as much as possible. So you would look at this for individual meters. Um, however, um, I'm aware that a lot of you manage multi-site and, and multi-building portfolios. Um, and, and as an energy manager myself, the, the big problem is often, where do I focus my limited amount of resource? So we have something called the Portfolio Manager in Sentinel. Um, and we're going to be looking at a demo restaurant chain, famous household UK chain, um, and their electrical consumption for this year. Uh, so this first view, what this is showing us is the difference between our active and our silent hours. Active hours being where your, your building, your shop, your, your university is open, it's operational. You would expect it to be using the, the energy it's using. Um, and conversely, silent is where the building is closed or non-operational, and you would expect there the energy to be essentially at a base load level. Now, what you can see here is this kind of 80-20 split is probably about what we'd expect to see. Um, but then we've got some of these stores here that, that's almost 50-50. So one area of investigation would be to look at these. Um, and as you'll note, this is quite coincidentally landed on Plymouth. Um, we would want to understand why they're using so much power when the restaurant is closed. It may be that they're not turning things off. Um, may, it's an opportunity to really share best practice from somewhere like Leicester or, or potentially somewhere like Swindon that seems to be have a much more um, pleasing ratio of active to silent. We can actually put the real numbers to this. So if we click just on the silent, what we're now looking at is the... Once this spins through. Okay, so now what we have are each of our restaurants with their silent consumption um, for this year. Let's try and find Plymouth. So Plymouth is here. So while they're not actually using a lot on average on a daily basis, the percentage of it to their active is quite large. So... Uh, I know, obviously, with COVID, restaurants have had limited and restricted hours this year. But for me, that would still potentially um, focus on a point of identification and what can we do to rectify that. Um, overall, if we're looking at the stores as a whole, we can look at their average monthly consumption for this year. Um, so what we now have, we can now see that the Strand on an average monthly basis is using 18,000 kilowatt hours, and that represents 4.5% of our portfolio. Um, I know uh, Doug was showing a Pareto line of his suppliers earlier. Uh, this Pareto line here represents the contribution to your overall portfolio. So you can see here that just under 50% is taken up by 15 stores. So again, potentially there's another area of where you could focus your energy. You have 15 stores that represents 50% of your energy portfolio. If you could save 10% across each of those stores, you know, you're really making a, a strong effort reducing your cost, consumption and carbon. Um, what we can also do, though, as I'm sure some of you are thinking, well, you know, Plymouth's quite a small restaurant. Uh, the Strand in London's probably huge. And you're right. We can actually normalize that against the floor area. So now what we're looking to do is, is really compare the stores on a kilowatt hour per meter square basis. Um, and, and the aim of this is really to, to get everything in line with each other. Uh, as you can see here, uh, Bristol is now the largest consumer, now represents nearly 5% of our portfolio. Um, and potentially you would say, actually, well, maybe Bristol is the area that we want to investigate first. Um, additionally, what we can actually do is set a baseline on each of these stores. Um, and an energy model has been set up for uh, absolute 29 consumption of electricity. Um, what you can see, there we go, there's Plymouth. 
that is currently doing 62,000 kilowatt hours better than its performance in 2019. Um, you can also now see Bristol is actually using more energy in 2021 than it did in 2019, um, which given everything we've gone through in the last 18 months is, is very confusing. And realistically, that should probably be the, the first place that you would go as an energy manager to understand what's gone right or, or wrong um, with a view that you can uh, take that knowledge and spread that across the other 48 stores. Um, as I said, realistically, I've, I've got five hours of conversation for this and, and, and only probably three minutes left. So I'm going to leave it there. I'd like to thank everybody for, for coming along. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, otherwise, I'll be handing back to Paul. Thanks very much, Darren. And um, we're hopefully going to have a few minutes at the end of the session for some questions that have come through. Um, so thanks ever so much for that. Um, and now, last but definitely not least, uh, we have Adam Jones from this share, share group. So, Adam, Hello. welcome to the stage, and um, please, please let us know a bit more about LiftShare. That'd be great. Of course, yeah, no worries. Um, so, yeah, as as Paul said, my name's Adam Jones um, from the LiftShare group. Um, so, a little bit about us. So, you know, we've been the trailblazers in terms of uh, making the commute as efficient as possible reducing miles, taking cars off the network uh, for the last 22 years. Um, and in terms of miles off the network, so just before COVID, we took our billionth mile off the network. Uh, and then we were projected to do that same feat every three years. Um, obviously, we know 18 months ago, things just completely stopped. People stopped commuting, people stopped traveling altogether. Um, so what this enabled us to do is rather than sit on our hands and just hope that people are going to go back to, to car sharing and lift sharing, is to develop a new proposition that we call Mobility Ways. Consider Mobility Ways almost as a, a data partner for any organization or business. Um, and what we're doing is we're on a mission to make zero carbon commuting a reality. We understand that you know commuting is rarely looked at, it's rarely included in any strategies, and we think it kind of comes down to the ability to not be able to define it, not be able to uh, set benchmarks or targets against it. It's almost like that mystery thing in the ether. Um, that organizations just can't quite get to grips with. So really why, you know, why are we targeting you? Because I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, well, Adam, you know, no one's commuting anymore, or we've implemented this working from home strategy or flexible working strategy. We've done our part, let's wash our hands. But Transport Extra released an article this morning that was now back up to pre-COVID levels. And if you just take a second and think about that, that's before the majority of workforces have even started to implement this flexible working pattern. So we run a real risk, I guess, of people avoiding public transport and everybody getting into their car to drive back to work and us almost taking a step back to worse than it was before. So although at the moment it might not feel like it, we know sort of come October, November, traffic levels are going to go through the roof as, as organisations start to look to bring their staff um, back to work. So a bit of understanding. So pre-COVID, um, the commute made up 18 billion kilograms of CO2 annually. It's 5% of total UK emissions, and it actually makes up 25% of the transport sector, which, as we all know, hasn't really done much in terms of pulling its weight for emissions reductions over the last 30 years. Compare it to the energy sector, who's seen a 64% decrease in that same period. You know, we want to play our part, use our 22 years of experience and knowledge a behavioural change of commuting, work with clients to try and get them on board. So where do we start with all this? So as I've said, we start by understanding the emissions and setting a benchmark. So Mobility Ways is designed the ACEL calculator. So it stands for Average Commuter Emissions Levels. And what it does is it allows an organisation to benchmark the current emission state of their commuters. So really, really simple. All you would be able to do is upload your own travel survey data into our system. It will take all of that data based on people's modes and how they're traveling. It will then use the latest DEFRA assumptions in terms of CO2 output per mode. So the average emissions. Yes. Oh, sorry, just to interrupt. Um, where you're not in slideshow mode, would you be able to put the oh. presentation into slideshow mode? Because it's it's currently just stationary at the moment. Oh, I'm not sure. Okay. Because um, I'm on slideshow mode on my. 
Oh, uh, okay. So it has so, moved on now onto onto the relevant slide. Um, Darren says is, it's is it, right. Has it gone into full screen now? Adam, can I check? Did you share window or entire screen? I shared window, I think. Okay, what I might do is bring your presentation off. If you can yeah. stop sharing and then share entire screen, that should solve it. Okay, let's do this. Okay, let me know. Yeah, that's the one. Look at that look, brilliant. I'm glad we did the rehearsal yesterday. Um, yeah, so essentially what we want to do is want an organization to be able to benchmark the emissions coming from their commuters. So like I said, we'll take the latest DEFRA assumptions on modes, average emissions for car, for train, for bus. We'll then take that and create a total amount of emissions. So you can see bottom right here in tons of CO2 being produced by those commuters. Divide that number by the number of commuters, so you know, just under 8,000 here, and we'll be able to give an average commuter emission level. So what this is saying is that for every commuter um, across Plymouth, they're producing 607 kilograms of CO2 every year. And then, of course, we'll go into a modal breakdown so we can start to look at the worst offenders. And we all know nine times out of ten, it's, it's driving alone, you know, and how do we shift those people away? So that's great. You've set your benchmark target. Fantastic. We've got a point to reference going forward. But what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to set realistic and achievable modal shift targets. You know, so there is no point as an organization saying, you know, great, I want 40 percent of my staff to cycle if it's not feasible, if it's not realistic or, att or attainable. So the next step of this is we do something called scoping smart mobility, where we take anonymous postcode data of employees across an organization. We then process it through our software. And what it will do is it'll produce all of the available travel modes for those individuals. So if we start with public transport, what we've done here is we've done this for an NHS organization. It shows us who does and doesn't have viable public transport options, by which we mean it would take them no more than twice the duration it would to drive to get there. You can see here in the green dots, all these guys have a viable public transport option, which sometimes helps debunk the myth of buses aren't very good around here. They don't work for me. And you can then see here in the orange and the red dots, these are non-viable transport options. So although they're there, the likelihood is they're going to take too long and be too sort of inefficient, really, for any user to use them. So we take this data, we uh, bring in the operators, as you can see on the right hand side here, probably start with first in Leeds, share this data, which allows them to have a look at their current provision, make data decision or data driven decisions on improving uh, current service, making it more efficient, or there's sometimes a business case to um, put on new services altogether. And this is a great tool as well if you've already saturated the, lo the local labour market to be able to say, well, we've got these cohorts of people, they can't get there, let's work with bus networks to see if we can do something about that. The second element of this is what we've done for the last 22 years, is looking at all those people that could share their journey to work. And not only that, and it's more relevant in the current climate than ever, looking at those people that have multiple lift share options. So all of these people that you can see in green here have nine or more lift share options that live within a mile of their house. So when we're talking about shift patterns, flexible working, finding someone that you just get on with, you know, the higher likelihood of having multiple options means that the scheme should have a higher likelihood of being successful when we implement it. Again, from a recruitment and retention point of view, you can start to utilize lift share as well if you've got holes in provision or people can only access it by a car, if it's in a remote location, you can start to use this as a real viable option to get people that maybe are on a lower salary, can't drive, don't have a car, you know, to come to site and be able to work for you. And then the final piece of the scoping puzzle, which is where all the money's been going, government uh, and the concentration, rightly so, has been gone into active travel. You know, so looking at encouraging walking and cycling. So what we have here in front of us inside the little green heat map is all those people that could viably walk. So it's going to take them no more than 30 minutes average walking pace and it's a mile and a half. And the orange heat map shows all those people that could cycle, have a reasonable cycle option. So again, 30 minutes average cycling pace or six miles. And this is all done on actual cycle routes as opposed to just as the crow flies. So you know, nobody's going down the M1, for example. Once we've done this and gathered this data, that's fantastic. But what we want to be able to do is communicate designated uh, incentives or options to the right people. So there's no point in sending blanket comms out about cycling if I live 40 miles away. You know, we want to be able to say, you're the guys that realistically could cycle, you're our target audience, 
I'm going to communicate an incentive or a call to action or something to you guys specifically because we know that's the best chance of you converting over to cycling. Same with lift share, same with public transport. The best example I can give you is we did this with TFGM uh, for a number of large employers. They identified who could and couldn't access the Metrolink system and then they then targeted those employees who could with an eight week 50% reduction on ticketing for Metrolink. They knew that their system, their service was good and eight weeks is a decent enough time to be able to embed that long-term behavioral change. So I've already talked about ACEL, how you get that understanding travel survey data. If you don't have that, we have this built in as well. So we have the ability to, to survey people, be it for the ACEL score to get your benchmark, or be it to say, you are our cyclists, what could we do to enable you to, to uptake cycling or to increase your cycling participation? Is it new showers? Is it lockers? You know, is it improved cycle infrastructure, which we know is, is a massive concern, being safe on the bike, but enables us to communicate with members and understand the barriers to change and really get underneath the skin of what's going to make people shift to a green and more sustainable travel mode. As I said already, we don't just sit on this data. Uh, we work with a number of amazing partners that can provide services that, that we don't and we never will, you know, from, from Nextbike through to Arriva and Enterprise. And we really want to sort of take a collaborative, joined up approach when we're sharing this data. It's not just a case of our public transport is poor. Great, it's poor. Who can we bring in to improve it? You know, or maybe there's a business case here for us to um, implement DRT. Great, let's bring Zelo in. Or maybe Car Club could increase based on the responses we've got from people. So we bring in enterprise. So we work with a bunch of really good um, partners and operators that provide solutions sort of far beyond our stretch. And of course, LiftShare forms one of those. And then the final piece of this puzzle, um, I'm obviously aware, I'll give some time for people to ask questions at the end, um, is how we deliver this. So that's great from a business case. We understand our emissions. We understand the art of the possible. We know where we need to focus our time and energy on improving transport and commuter options. How do we deliver it to the individual? So we do it through something called personal travel planning. So essentially, you can deliver uh, all the available options to any individual, either on bulk, they can complete it themselves, but it will show all their options uh, in sustainability order, in social distance order. If you want to promote one mode over another, we can do that. And it will break down the amount of calories they would save by shifting to that mode and the amount of trees they would offset by shifting from, say, single occupancy vehicle to walking. Uh, and then we also have, like I've said to you about the, the TFGM version, the ability to embed these calls to actions and these incentives directly into these plans. You know, so if one of your options is the Metro link, there's your link to be able to get your reduced ticketing. So in summary, a cyclical approach to this, you know, travel survey to then be able to feed into your ACL benchmark score. So understanding the emissions, understand the art of the possible, use both sets of data to be able to bring in partners and collaborate and make real um, viable changes to current provision or put on new, innovative, exciting services. Um, as I said, lift shares a part of that and then deliver that to the individuals, you know, to inform them and educate them. And we've got a real window of opportunity now, I think, before people revert to type, just jump back in their car to say, actually, this is a really good option that you could do. But, you know, it's about educating those individuals. Um, and we all say this, you know, from a, a commute point of view, benchmarking those emissions and then how low can you go with regards to those emissions? You know, how low can you drive them um, and keep driving them down? You know, and hopefully it encourages people to make this a part of their strategies going forward because it is, you know, you do have the ability to, to benchmark it and start to set targets against it now. So that's with me. Uh, any questions far away? But Paul, I'll hand back to you. That's fantastic. Thanks, Adam. Um, and in fact, Katie, would you be able to bring everyone back on screen? Because um, we've got 10 minutes or so for some questions. So I encourage um, anyone to, to uh, write down some questions, please, in the bottom right hand corner. And thanks, everyone, um, for taking the time out and, and um, coming along and, and presenting your work. Um, I'm just going to start with a, a, a general question, and it's one that I'm keen to ask a, a number of the sessions that I'm chairing in. And this is about what, what can we do? What actions can we take? And so um, particularly Jack and Doug, um, I'm wondering what actions can particularly large organisations, what can they do to reduce their carbon? 
especially if they're starting on this journey towards net zero. So, um, Jack, would you be able to, to just start us off and, and um, uh, just give us some ideas around that? That would be fantastic. Thank you. Sure, no problem. So, so my background is obviously in energy and water, so I'm going to tackle it from that perspective. Um, I think it's really, really important to engage with, with your staff um, and your maybe your students or your visitors and customers about behavioural change activities that they can all be part of and, and make sure that everybody is, is on board with the idea. Um, but it, from a wider perspective, it's also really important to do those the usual activities like investigating LED lighting, um, opportunities for solar PV, definitely some really good places to start. Um, at, at the university, we're doing we're doing just those things. We, we're not beyond beyond those ideas at all. We've still got projects of LED lighting going on and trying to fill our roofs with with them um, with PV. We're also really encouraging um, increase in behavioural change from like our students and our staff perspective. So it's something that's always ongoing. Um, it's definitely a good place to start the journey, but you can never finish with that. It's definitely something that that takes a long time to go through. Brilliant. Thanks, Jack. Um, Louise, I was wondering, as we go around the, 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 the square, it's going to get more difficult, but I just wondered if you have any, anything to add in terms of other things, particularly from your experience uh, at the hospital and in your current role as well. Yes, yeah, so um, slightly different take on it in the fact that I think it's really important to make sure you embed sustainability into other policies and strategies within the organisation. So one of the things that um, you get a lot of feedback in our field is that um, it feels like a very separate piece of work, but actually, as we know, sustainability is intertwined into every single activity we do. So making sure you work with your HR colleagues, so when they're looking at flexible working and new ways of working, that you embed that um, sustainability a slant to it. So they're also looking at the environmental um, impacts as well as the social and people impacts. Um, procurement obviously is a real biggie so definitely working with your procurement um, colleagues to make sure you've got a sustainable procurement process in place so working with that supply chain to get those those embodied emissions down but generally totally agree with Jack at the heart of all sustainability is the behavior change stuff so as you said I've just come from um, the NHS and one of the things that we did there was very much around um, making our behavioural change programmes seem as if they're not sustainability or energy behaviour change programmes, which seems a bit bizarre, but actually making it look like it's very much in line with exactly the, the um, objectives of individual areas. So, for example, with our clinicians, we linked it very much to improving the healthcare outcomes of our patients. And we were still doing the same things that we needed to do. So opening those curtains, letting in lots of light, letting in natural air, all these things that there are a lot of scientific evidence can prove can help and improve the well-being of your patients. But actually it also helps us with our sustainability targets to make sure they switch off the lights and, and make sure they do make um, use of these natural, natural um, light and uh, natural um, products that we're given. That's great. Thanks, Louise. Now, Doug, this is going to be a lot harder for you now, but um, <laughs> any, anything else to add to that? And if not, don't worry, that's fine. <laughs> uh, well, I couldn't actually hear what Louise was saying, but I, I'll just say briefly, um, uh, I would certainly recommend starting by the footprint of your organisation, because that will show you where your hotspots are. Um, and I think for quite a lot of businesses in Devon that are traveling around a rural county, uh, your transport requirements can be quite significant in terms of carbon. Um, and so start taking that opportunity each time a, f a vehicle requires replacing to have the opportunity to look at what the market's doing in terms of providing electric vehicles. They're coming out all the time now, looking at your usage pattern to see if an electric vehicle would be useful um, and seeing if you could start integrating those into your fleet. That's fantastic. Thanks, Doug. Um, Adam and Darren, did you want to add anything from, from your perspectives? I just think, yeah, from my point of view, I think it's just be proactive rather than reactive. You know, especially in our space, I think people wait till the problem is upon them before they do anything. You know, like I was saying earlier, I can guarantee, you know, sort of come October, November, 
there'll be a sort of a huge kickoff and concern when everyone decides that they're going to return to the office all at once by themselves. Um, so I think if you're going to be a proactive organisation, just understand what that looks like and try and combat it as much as you can. You know, just to try and avoid that sort of car-led COVID recovery, really. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Adam. Um, and Darren, this is really tricky for you. I appreciate it. Um, and, and I think um, one of the things that I want to emphasize is that we, we use um, energy software at the University of Plymouth, um, and we, we, um, we find it really helpful from, from our own perspective. Um, so anything you want to add, or, is, or have we really covered everything? And, and that's fine if we have. Um, I think from my perspective, I mean, everything that's been discussed is is all very good uh, from, I suppose, the angle that I'm working at it from is understand what you're doing, kind of reflecting on what Doug said. You need to know where you are before you can set any plans for the future. So, you know, from an energy perspective, what are your buildings doing? What are your sites doing? And have you done the basics? You know, the, the, you know, everything that's talked about today is very good. But are you doing the basics? Are you turning things off at the end of the day? Uh, if if you're not there at the weekend, uh, do you know what your base load is? Do you know how low you can get to? And are you there every weekend? Um, and that's something that you can get from energy management software. And additionally, the behavioral stuff that Jack was talking about, it's great doing it and it's great launching it, but you need to know what effect it's having uh, to make sure that it's it's of use. So again, an energy management software, which can deploy soft dashboarding to your students, your your staff, uh, your facilities people. Um, that's really key in getting the message out so that people know and that they are having an impact because you need to engage with people if you want them to get on board with your zero carbon journey. That's fantastic. And um, thanks. can I thank everyone here for um, their presentations with a a few technical challenge, which hopefully you <laughs> noticed before. Um, so thanks everyone for for um, persevering with us. Um, and just one other thing, Paul, Paul Barnard, I noticed you've asked a question around getting positive peer challenge across the organisations in the city. Well, that's that's what we are definitely doing within the Plymouth Net Zero Carbon Action Group. And at actual fact, we've got a a standing item which is all about sharing our carbon action plans and so that's something that we're we're definitely doing um every couple of months through the plymouth net zero carbon action okay well thanks everyone for coming um we now have a 30 minutes break um for you to go and uh, grab some coffee and a cup of tea um, before the film that's on at half past four so thanks everyone and um Look forward to seeing you all later. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.